So it seems that we are live and recording as well. I suppose we've got to do both together. So, <laughs> okay. Very good. Good morning, everybody. Um, should we just give one more minute to see if we can get eight to seven? Because Ajahn thinks that five people might have got enlightened. That's why they're not here. Um, and people are still turning up. But uh, very shortly, Ajahn will begin with the Dharma talk. And uh, eight to seven now. Eight to seven now. Mm -hmm. How many do you reckon we'll get? Yeah, oh, eight to nine. <laughs> Two people <laughs> went backwards. <laughs> I think since yesterday we start. I started giggling, and so now we're in a sort of bit of a silly mood. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Not that you're okay. any less silly than usual. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're rude about that, doesn't I? What? Being silly? <laughs> Accusing a teacher of being silly. Oh, I thought it'd be a compliment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, now there's only 86, Ajahn. You got that other person enlightened. Yeah. Or maybe they, they saw us and then they said, oh, no, not again. <laughs> okay, we better stop this. So take it away. We're ready to go. Okay, another Dharma talk. And then maybe 50 minutes, we'll stop for a break. And then we'll do the guided meditation at the end. So yesterday, I did give uh, the talk about kind of stages of meditation and okay if any of you i can see all your pictures on the screen there if any of you find it difficult to hear just you know put your uh, hands in your ears or do something to let us know it's difficulty hearing uh, but if you can hear okay then just enjoy so yesterday i gave the simile of um we go no, I'm just trying to get you more central. Okay. It's okay. Yesterday I gave like the simile of those first two stages of meditation. And uh, it's just establishing mindfulness as a priority and giving some idea of what that mindfulness, what that sati really is. And you know after a while, you know, from your own experience, what lots of mindfulness is again when you can see so much deeper into phenomena now everybody has mindfulness even someone who is drunk uh, they can find their way back to their home sometimes you don't know how they do it they're drunk they don't know the right way but somehow or other they get back home they have a little bit of mindfulness enough awareness to be able to find their way home, even though they're sozzled with alcohol. And nevertheless, that is obviously not the mindfulness which we need uh, in meditation. It's not that beneficial. In fact, it's not beneficial at all. But then we have that mindfulness of everyday life. You're driving your car, you're doing your work, you're talking to people. But even that is only just you know, ordinary mindfulness. And the mindfulness which we can develop, which is enormously helpful for getting insight, for understanding our body, understanding our mind, understanding everything about life, that type of mindfulness needs extreme power. I shouldn't have said extreme, but a lot of power, where whatever you see, you can see it so deeply. And the weird thing about such mindfulness is even the colors become so rich and the shapes, the contours, everything becomes delightful. You see so much joy in things. And the quote I usually give is a quote from William Blake. He was one of these English poets and uh, artists uh, around the 1600s, I believe. And he was, uh, he, he gave a lot of poetry. And one of the, one of the poems which I really liked was uh, just uh, four lines which said, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, 
hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And I would just let you know that this talk will last for an hour. So <laughs> it'll be like an eternity for you. But the only reason why he said eternity, obviously, uh, was because it scanned uh, in an hour, sorry. It rhymed with flower. But the rest of what he was saying there is very profound. To see a world in a grain of sand. So often in our life, we're going so fast and our mindfulness is so weak. And what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears, we're only picking up a fraction of the information which that experience is making available for us. But when we have stronger mindfulness, everything starts to become um, amplified. The colors become richer, the sounds become deeper, and the tastes become more delicious. And so this is you know, one of the reasons you know, why I get fat. All the food they give me on retreats tastes, tastes extra special. It's not because of the cooks put lots of effort into it, it's because I put effort into my mindfulness. And so the toast this morning, oh, it was scrumptious. Okay, these are, my, these are my excuses, don't say the butter. <laughs> but anyhow, the, all the life becomes more joyful. If you wonder why it is the monks and nuns, you see them smiling, you see them happy. Why? It's not because we don't do any work. Sometimes we do more work than most people. It's not that just we have an easy lifestyle. Sometimes our lifestyle just is more responsibility than most, and especially for myself. That it's, I'm 71 now. It's time I should retire. However, <laughs> I can't retire. I have to work till I drop. Sometimes I thought, like many people in England, to go on a strike for better conditions. So I decided to sit down quietly, do a sit down strike, and people thought, oh, he's only meditating, leave him alone, he's enjoying himself. <laughs> I don't know what I can do to strike. But anyhow, the mindfulness does bring around a lot of joy and happiness, lightness. You do see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. You pick up so much joy and beauty in this world, and sometimes in places where you least expect. Okay, here it comes. The babies. No, no, the babies. <laughs> now, this is a real story. You know, sometimes I wonder whether I should say it or not, but here it comes. And this was when I was teaching a meditation retreat over in Australia. And of course, when I teach, I don't just sit in front of the camera, in front of the microphone and just keep on talking. I practice with everybody. And so my meditation will be really deep. And on this one occasion, a lovely meditation after giving a talk, and after the meditation was completed, just like every human being, you had to go to the toilet. And that day, I had to do what they call a number two. People understand that in UK as well, what a number two is, and a number one. I had to do a number two. And so I went to the toilet cubicle, sat down and did my business. And I made a mistake. My mistake was <laughs> that after completing my business, I looked in the toilet bowl to see what I'd done. And as I looked in the toilet bowl, I went, wow, wow. That's amazing. It was the most beautiful, <laughs> the most beautiful piece of feces I'd ever laid in my whole life. Now people can just ignore that and flush it away. But next time you go into the loo after a nice meditation, have a look for yourself. It's not just one shade of brown. There are many deep shades of brown, lighter shades of brown. And the way that all those little balls are just stuck together 
it's just like a work of art, like it's been sculptured by a Rodin, it's been painted by a Leonardo. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And not only gorgeous, there's always a little bit of um, something on it which makes it sparkle. It's like, <laughs> like jewelry. And I was just looking at it, and I'm not exaggerating. I went, wow, wow, that's amazing. And then I decided to just test out the, the <clears throat> fragrance of it. Now, of course, there are many scents and perfumes which people spend hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds buying. But this, this fragrance was, it had the, the, it was real. It was earthy, natural. It hadn't been concocted in some laboratory by people looking for money. And when I imbibed it, oh, it filled your lungs with this gorgeous natural aroma. Now, don't think I'm crazy and mad. This really happened, and I was really enjoying every moment of it. Of course, then you had to face the consequences, which was, I did think of taking it out of the bowl and showing it to the people on the retreat, but I had enough common sense, they probably wouldn't appreciate that. So what I did, to, I put my hand on that button, uh, you know, on the top of the toilet, the flush button. And that was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. First of all, you put your finger on top, then just, you couldn't push it. No, I can't do this. It was attachment. I've been attached to some weird things in my life, but that was something which I think you will all agree is weird. And many times I tried to press, I just couldn't do it. And it was only because of the training I'd had in so many years of letting go. Only because of that, because I finally, after many minutes, pressed that button and the most beautiful piece of feces swirled down the toilet hole and went out of my life forever. That was so sad. <laughs> Well, the point of that story was it actually looked beautiful and fragrant and everything about it was amazing. And it's an extreme example because if you can see beauty and fragrance in a piece of SHIT, then where can you not find beauty and fragrance? And this was actually quite challenged me how one's perceptions when one has strong mindfulness can be turned around almost completely. And you can see beauty where you never expected to see it before. You see joy where you never expected to see it before. You see it in your breath and you're breathing in, breathing out. Just as the Buddha said, as you breathe in and breathe out, you experience pity and sukha this joy and happiness. How on earth can that happen? The breath is just the breath. If you tell people who've never meditated before, you can breathe in just so much joy and bliss. And you can breathe out joy and bliss. They think you're either crazy or you're on some type of drug. There's one lady who came on one of my retreats over in Perth she was an exec from some big company in Sydney. And she told me she had to beg, you know, to be able to go off on a retreat you know, from her boss. But she managed to get permission to come for the retreat. And when she went back on the Monday morning, uh, the boss said to her, what have you been doing at that retreat? You know, you look so much happier and healthy. Look, he said, I don't care what you've been doing. I don't care what drug you've been taking, but please make sure you bring me back some of that next time. No, she never was taking any drugs. It's just the idea of being on a retreat caused so much happiness and joy in her, that even her boss noticed that. It's weird that we can spend so much money and take illegal substances to try and get happy, when it's this meditation enhances our awareness and the awareness gets so strong that we can see beauty in some of the most uh, 
unlikely places. If any of you are artists in all the many types of art which we have in the world, now you may understand why some monks and nuns who meditate have great artworks. They start to really appreciate the beauty available for everybody to see. But when our minds are tired, worn out, exhausted because of stress, it means we go in our life and we cannot see the beauty which other people can see. That's one of the big problems of our life. The beauty is out there, but can you see it? Even I know this because I was once doing so much work. You now I had a, a monastery which I was looking after. It's only a small monastery. It's now 366 acres or something. 366 acres. That's a huge piece of, uh, many pieces of land. And I also have a city center. Sometimes I would joke. I've got my town residence and my country estate, like many other lords of the manor. But anyway, it's not as if I, you know, own those. You have to work in those. So I'd be in our city centre in Perth on the weekend and go back to the monastery on Sunday evening and until Friday. Many of you have visited me uh, or visited our um, monasteries over in Perth, every monastery takes a lot of work to look after. And that's why, you know, please look after Venerable Chanda because she does so much work and she needs assistance wherever she can find it to be able to look after even a small house like this. Is it a lot of work? The admin is. The admin, yeah. Well, that's actually part of it. If it didn't have the house, it didn't have the community, it wouldn't have the admin. I think it's the other way around. You didn't have the admin yet, yeah, both ways around. <laughs> they depend upon one another. So anyhow, it was so much work that after the weekend work, I was tired. And then you go on Monday morning back to your monastery and you had many more things to do. And it became so tiring that I remember one day being with a visitor on a Monday morning and they said, what a beautiful monastery you have. And you know, I come here and I say, what a beautiful house this is here. And you say, beautiful house, Ajahn Brahm, you don't have to do the admin and the cleaning. And that was a true comment. It was a beautiful monastery for visitors. But if you are an owner, if that's your place, there's so much work, you cannot see the beauty. And I realized when other people said I was living in a beautiful monastery, and I couldn't see it, there was something wrong there. So I made a vow that every Monday morning, just a Monday morning for me, <clears throat> I would pretend I was a visitor to the monastery of which I was the abbot. So if any monk had a problem with their meditation on a Monday morning and they came to see me, I'd say, I'm sorry, I'm only a visitor this morning. Wait until the afternoon and ask your question. If any uh, person came from overseas, we want to see Ajahn Brahm, I'm saying he's not here this morning because I'm just a visitor. Anything went wrong with the plumbing, with the building, any crises happened, I'm sorry, I'm only visiting today. And I assumed that character of a visitor 100%. And I noticed something very wonderful. When I was a visitor and not an owner, when I was a visitor, I didn't have any responsibility. When you go to a restaurant for lunch or for dinner, do you ever do the washing up afterwards? That's a restaurant's job, not yours. You're just a visitor. When you go to a nice park in the center of the town in which you live, do you have to mow the grass and sweep the paths in that uh, public park? No, that's the local council's job to mow the lawn and keep it clean. You're just a visitor. 
And when you're a visitor, not an owner, you can enjoy your surroundings so much to the max. It is one of the reasons why, please, when you're on a retreat, when you're meditating, meditate as if you are just visiting your body. Don't even call it your body. You're visiting the body, which bears your name. You're visiting the mind, which is connected to your body. Meditate as if you were a visitor rather than as an owner. And sometimes people ask me, how can we use these Buddhist ideas of non-self in our meditation? That is one of the best ways to use non-self. You don't own the body, you don't own the mind, you're just visiting, which means you can start to see its beauty. and You don't have any responsibilities to fix it up, to make it better, to find some peace, to do something. That's not your job. You're just visiting, not owning. So those types of similes allow you to see the beauty in a monastery which has so many things to be fixed up. You can see the, the beauty as a visitor, not an owner. When you do your meditation like that, you're just visiting the body, visiting the mind for an hour or whatever, then you don't have so much responsibility. It's not a stressful task for you. It is knowing it rather than doing it. And when one can meditate like that, it's more fun, more delightful. And when it becomes more fun and more delightful, you don't fall asleep. The sloth and torp in meditation doesn't happen. I've often noticed, I noticed this even when, I noticed this even when I was a, uh, a student. One experience I had was uh, going to Central America when I just turned 18 before going to university in Guatemala, uh, Belize, that's British Honduras, and obviously Southern Mexico. But one of the things I'd always wanted to do was to go and visit those great pyramids in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula in the vicinity of Tikal. I don't know why I wanted to go there. It was an adventure. And the only way you could go there, you know, was on uh, buses, the local buses, buses, and on um, uh, fishing boats, and on old trucks. It took days to get to this place. But I do remember on the fishing boat going up from the port city uh, up to the river, which was a boundary between Belize and Guatemala. And as you were going up the coastline, the dawn broke over the Caribbean. And it was one of the most beautiful dawns I've ever seen. And even though I hadn't slept all night, there's no way you could sleep. The joy and the delight were too strong for sleep to take over your brain. And that was one of those experiences, which I remember because it was very pleasant, which also taught me that the way to overcome sloth and torpor is when you start seeing the beauty in your body and the delight in your mind. And that energizes the mind so much that you don't need to just to turn off your awareness. The awareness gets enhanced. So, as we practice like this, as a visitor rather than an owner, we get more joy in our meditation. And that joy, that delight in our meditation, that is really important. I've known in all the years which I've done meditation, that if you hear a brilliant Dhamma talk or something really inspires you, it gets so easy to close your eyes and you don't have stillness yet, but you have joy, inspiration, 
and their inspiration makes the meditation just flow so deeply, so powerfully. I've had some of the best meditations after listening to a very wonderful talk by someone like Anachan Chah. And sometimes he really just um, uplifts you so much and you get so uh, empowered as well as inspired, the meditation becomes easy. Not that Ajahn Chah was always a great teacher. Sometimes he would go on for hours and be very, very boring. But nevertheless, wonderful things could still happen. There was a story of this novice monk. You know, if you've ever been to Thailand or any of those uh, Asian countries where Buddhism is strong, sometimes some of those... Um, some of those uh, young monks, they went to those monastery, monasteries because there was no other place they could go. It was like a social safety net. And this one young novice monk, he was uh, in the evening listening to Ajahn Chah give a boring sermon. It went on and on and on. And being only about 11 or 12, this young novice kept on thinking when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? And Ajahn Chah went on and on and on. And then the novice just turned that complaint around. Instead of saying, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? This little novice said to himself, when am I going to stop? And that novice stopped. When he opened his eyes, it was many hours later. And it was the dawn. All the monks had bowed, done their chanting and left <clears throat> after the talk had finished. This was the first time that little novice had gone into one of his very deep meditations. He'd been perfectly aware for many hours, but not of the talk or the outside world, perfectly aware of the inner bliss of the deep meditations. Those are the sorts of things which happen. Remember, he had not much experience of the deeper stages of meditation before. It was just that inspirational letting go. When am I going to stop? And he stopped. Sometimes if I come to a place like UK, I sometimes look around to see you know, what signals there are pointing me towards Buddhism, even pointing me towards religion. I don't have many churches left, not the ones I used to know when I lived here, not many crosses anywhere. But there's symbols of Buddhism in every crossroads of this country. I call them the stop sign. Stop. And I look upon that as the teaching of the Buddha in every crossroads of this country. Stop. Don't move. Don't go anywhere. Be still. And these are the types of inspirations which I see which allow me to stop. I know that sometimes people go to sort of cemeteries and they see all of these signs on the gravestones, RIP, rest in peace. There's something very wrong with that. Why do you have to die before you can rest in peace? I say, demand your right to rest in peace when you can enjoy it before you're dead, which is one of the reasons why the meditation, learning how to rest, to relax to the max in peace, is a beautiful way of enjoying you know, what you don't have after you die. The awareness is gone when you die. So rest in peace while you can enjoy it. Anyway, the main quackier, I keep on just 
wandering off on other parts of the Dharma, but I hope you enjoyed it so far. <laughs> the main aspect of the Dharma, which I wanted to teach uh, today about the meditation was again, adding to the stages of meditation, which people experience, understanding how they relate to one another and answering the question, which many people ask, I got to this stage of meditation, what should I do next? There's many mistakes even with that question. You know, how do I go on to the next stage of meditation? What should I do next? You don't, you never go on to the next stage of meditation. You go in to the next stage of meditation. In the different stages of meditation, the next stage is always right within the stage you're on right now. You go in, and how do you do that? This simile would explain it very clearly to you. And it's a simile which is borrowing from the Tibetan phrase of you know, the thousand petal lotus. The thousand petal lotus simile goes like this, that a lotus is closed at nighttime. And in the morning when the sun comes up, it is the light and the warmth of the sun when it hits the outermost petals of that lotus, the sheath. That is what opens the lotus. That uh, outermost petal, that those outermost petals get opened by the warmth and light of the sun. And once the outermost petals open up, it reveals the next layer of petals. So they can uh, open up, having been received the warmth and the light of the sun. And the next layer of petals open up, and the next layer of petals opens up. And when the layer of petals, which is closed right now, can receive the warmth and light of the sun, then that too opens up. They open up one after the other. And the next layer of petals is not next to the layer of petals open now, it is inside it. To go into the thousand petal lotus to find out what is at the heart of that thousand petal lotus, you have to go inside, always going inwards, inwards, inwards. And how do you go inwards? How do you open up these layers of petals? It is the warmth and the light of the sun. And of course, in this simile, that uh, the lotus flower stands for you. This you, this body and mind which bears your name. And uh, the uh, light and the warmth of the sun, that stands for not just mindfulness, which is the light, but also the kindness, which is the warmth. It's one of the reasons why for many years trying to be mindful without the kindness never worked. When you add the kindness to the mindfulness, it became like a sun, which not only had warmth, and not only had light, but also had warmth. And that is what's needed to open up the lotus flower. And I say that's each one of you, because sometimes you look at some beings who come to the temple or come to meditation retreats, and you think, what them? They've got no chance. I should never say that, but on this one occasion, the retreat I was giving in Perth, in Australia, this Aussie guy came to one of my retreats and he was tall, bushy haired with a beard. He had traditional Australian dress on. If you know, traditional Australian national costume. It was like a t-shirt shorts and just thongs and that's all traditional australian dress it was a hot day and he was covered with tattoos and when he came in he looked so rough i did judge him he looked so rough that i thought he must be uh, come to the wrong place not far from our monastery there is a prison Karna prison farm. 
And so when I saw him, I said to him, I actually said this, I should have never said this. I said to him, I think you've come to the wrong place. The prison is up the road. <laughs> and he insisted he had booked in for my retreat. So I, I checked, his name was on the list and I apologized. So he was, I'd never seen him before. He was such an unlikely person to be on my retreat. But nevertheless, now he booked in, so I let him in. I thought, oh, quacky, they should, should vet the people who come on my retreats with a bit more care. But even though he was a very, very rough outer skin of his uh, body and mind, he was the one on that retreat, the star of that retreat. When he came for the interviews, it was, blew my mind. He was describing perfectly the first jhana. He'd achieved that, he'd experienced that. And he was one of the most unlikely of customers. And that reinforced the simile of the thousand petal lotus. The outermost sheath of the lotus, which guards the innermost petals at night time, can look very rough, dirty, dusty, unlikely. And all those outermost sheaths of the lotus flower holds within it the most fragrant and beautiful and profound layers of petals protected deep inside the lotus flower. And that is a good, good description of you, all those on this retreat. It doesn't matter if you're old or if you're sick or if you're dying. Inside each one of you, it's these beautiful, beautiful, amazing flowers. And your job is to be able to open up the lotus flower. A layer of petals by layer of petals. So you use the awareness and kindness. That more than anything else. If you ask people, what should I do? Just be kind, be aware. And allow this body and mind of yours to open up, layer by layer. So that's one of the reasons, the first thing you do, you sit down on a chair, on a cushion, wherever, and as you close your eyes, you first become aware of the outermost layer of petals, your body. And you want to give that kindness and mindfulness. And that serves to relax this body take away all the aches and the pains and the business associated with this body. So the body, you don't decide to let it go, just like the body just opens up metaphorically. And you go inside of it. And this is where you start to see, seeing your mind. And the first thing you see usually when people just aren't so much aware of their body is all the business of their mind. And most of that business lies in the past or the future. They have the past and the future which you are aware of. Be kind to it. The way, best way to let go of the past painful or pleasant experiences of your life, to let go of the past, is to be kind to the past, to be aware of it and be kind to it, to soften it. And once you soften the past, it's so easy to let it go. It's not a big burden anymore. Don't try and kick the past into oblivion, you know, with any negativity. Just be kind to it. It relaxes. It's not a big problem anymore. And the same with the future. Be kind to the future. Sometimes we always judge the future with a negative mind. I can't do this any longer. This terrible thing is going to happen to me. It's all going to go wrong. For goodness sake, be kind to the future. Yes, it might go wrong, but it might go right too. When you have that kindness to the future, it's very easy to let it go. And also be kind to the present moment. Right now, how are you, what are you experiencing? Please give it importance and be kind to it. It may be unpleasant, but it's teaching you a valuable lesson in meditation. And after a while, it has to become soft and gentle. 
And when you are kind to the present moment, past and future just tend to vanish as you're going inside of time into this moment. As you go into the present moment more and more, yeah, you get sounds, you get descriptions, you get words, thinking. But if you can go right into the center of that thinking, sometimes I wrote that it's like you are standing at the door at a reception and you have to greet all these important people coming into your party. And you haven't got time to talk to any guests. If I talk to the guest who's coming in now, I will miss the guest who's coming in after them. So you cannot talk to anybody. You have to be so silent. You can greet every moment as it comes into your mind. This is where you get so into this moment that silence is the only option. Nothing else could happen. When you really are in the present moment and you have kindness, silence is what happens naturally. You don't force the mind to be silent. Silence happens. And how do you go to the next stage? There's no next stage. The next stage is kind of inside of this stage. You don't go on anywhere. You go in. Into the, into the silence, you may be surprised, but inside of the silence, that's where you start to be aware of the breathing. As I mentioned briefly to you, that's the only thing moving now. Everything else is calmed down. You're not aware of the body. You're not aware of the time and all the busyness associated with time. You're not aware of the words and the descriptions of things. You're just aware of the things by themselves without descriptions. You go into the silence and the thing which you usually become aware of is the breathing. It's the only thing left at this point of time. You, what do you do next? You don't do anything. Just keep being aware of the breath. And you don't need to give any names to the breath, in-breath, out-breath, buddho, buddho, or any other mantras, words you use. You're just aware with kindness. Let the breath breathe in as long as it wants. Breathe out as long as it wants or as short as it wants. Trust the breath. Your lungs know how to breathe much better than you do. So we just become this passive kind observer. And as you are doing this, actually not really doing it, you're not doing very much at all. You're just being a, a passenger. And a passenger doesn't have any stress, which means you relax so deeply. And as you're relaxing very, very deeply, it does mean that you don't need much air to breathe. It's like you go inside of this breathing. And as you're going inside of the breathing, it does mean that the breath kind of changes. I know in the Visuddhi Magga, it starts to talk about a simile of the breath. It's like a saw blade on a piece of wood. If you've ever done carpentry, when you first look at the saw blade, cutting the wood, you know, you can see the end of the saw and the beginning of the saw and see a lot of timber, a piece of wood which you're sawing up. But as you focus in, it's as if like you zoom in just to that little area where the blade meets the saw. And as you focus in on that area, all you can see is a couple of teeth of the saw, not the whole saw, but just a couple of teeth and maybe a centimeter of the wood. What's happening there, you can't see beginnings and ends. You just see that part of the saw hitting this part of the wood right now. And that's what it becomes like in the breath meditation. All you see is this part of the in-breath or the out-breath. You don't know which one is. it is happening right now. And because you're going into the breath, you find soon the breath disappears. It becomes very peaceful, very joyful. You're opening up the lotus flower 
to see the beauty, the joy in your mind. And it's in Anapanasati that becomes the fifth and sixth, sixth stages of Anapanasati. And how do you go on to the next stage? The next stage within the stage you're in now. You tend to, like when you go on a Google Maps or something, you zoom in, you focus in on it, and doesn't, you, that's not what you do. You're just a passenger just watching all this thing happen. If you try to get involved, if you start to get excited, or start to you know, think, oh, it's too much for me, and try to come out, it does disturb everything. It's totally safe. All you need to do is just to, again, be aware and be kind. That is all. And then after a while, just you know, through patience, these sorts of things have to happen. The joy gets so strong, the breath disappears. And then you see these beautiful lights in the mind. You're going into this thing which we call the mind. The question last night was a great one. What is the mind? This is actually where you find out for yourself, not as a theory, but as your own personal experience. You access your mind. Why don't you call it your mind? You're just a visitor. You don't own it. And as you explore it more and more, it becomes so much more pleasurable. The inner petals of the lotus are always the most beautiful, the most fragrant. And this is what you're doing. There's still quite a ways to go to go deeply inside of the lotus. And this is how the meditation works. You don't do anything. You don't strive. You don't uh, have a goal which you work so hard to complete. Your job is to let go of all of that. All you need to do is just to be aware and be kind. No more than that. And the awareness and the kindness lead you into these deep, deep, deep meditation states. Whether you like it or not, you're just sitting there, being patient, and watching it all happen. And that becomes one of the most amazing parts of the meditator's life. They may have struggled for years trying to do things. Always asking questions, what should I do? How should I get there? And in the end, they realized all they needed to do was nothing. Just be aware and be kind and everything opens up. Just like that little kid. When is Ajahn Chah going to stop? He knew, when am I going to stop? He stopped. Or just like that uh, Australian national, national dress full of tattoos. He knew how to stop rather than to strive. He became very peaceful, even in these deep blisses of the might of jhanas. So that's how it works. Okay, so that's 10 to 9. So now's the opportunity for you to go to the letting go room. You know the letting go room, don't you? That's the toilet. Get a bit of exercise if you need to, and then I'll continue on a cup. a cup of tea. Yeah, 15 minutes. And if you come back by five past nine, we can do a guided meditation. He's ready to go. Okay, Matthias, are we all okay to start the guided meditation? Yes, the green means that okay. the live streamers are there. So oh, for excellent. those watching on live stream, it's meditation time with Ajahn Brahm. Excellent. So welcome, everybody. I am now going to close my eyes. I invite everyone else to do the same. And we'll do a guided meditation. About See how it goes, 20 minutes, half an no, hour? 50 minutes. Yeah. So the guidance is at the beginning. And then I'm quiet. The whole purpose of the guidance is to get you off in the correct direction, like aiming an arrow. And once that arrow is on its journey, I always like to have each one of you to take over the guidance. In fact, not even guidance, but learning how to let things go and be at peace. And whichever way that arrow goes afterwards, 
it goes in a beautiful direction. That's wonderful. It goes in a direction which you know, is not so wise. At least we learn from that. One of my first teachers of meditation would always tell me there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Every meditation you can learn from and grow from. So because of that, I just give this first part of the guided meditation in words. And then afterwards, I'm quiet. Let you just carry on and see just how peaceful and how delightful it can be. So anyway, I'm now closing my eyes. And hopefully that uh, I don't speak so quietly that you cannot hear me. Again, if you cannot hear me, please send a, some sort of message you know, to uh, Matthias or to Derek, and then they will come and let me know that even though I've got my eyes closed, that I should be speaking more loudly. So anyhow, first of all, with your eyes closed, remind yourself of what you're doing in this meditation. This meditation we're going to do is not for the purpose of solving all the problems in your life. It's not for the purpose of thinking. It's not for the purpose of writing your biography. It's not for the purpose of planning what you're going to do at Christmas. The meditation is for the purpose of peace, stillness. Many of you have been meditating for many years. So you should know the type of meditation which you have experienced in the past, which is very beautiful and very powerful. So once you remember some of the most beautiful and powerful meditations you've ever experienced, what caused them? Because in meditation, our job is to recreate the causes. The results will come in by themselves. And I know that one of those causes is by being able to put your body in a comfortable position. So comfortable that you don't need to move it during the meditation. If you get it right at the beginning, then you're sweet at the end. And the type of position which is the best is not the one which is so comfortable now, but one which you can maintain in reasonable comfort for the whole time of the meditation, which is about 50 minutes. So spend a few moments investing your wisdom in ensuring that your bodily posture is comfortable and sustainable. So I'm checking on my legs, my butt, my back, shoulders, in my arms and hands as well, but I never find any difficulty in those areas. And my face. And especially I make sure that my head is well balanced on top of the neck. It's not too far forward. If it's too far forward, that's a sign of sleepiness. If it's too far to the left or the right, that's a sign of stress. If it's too far back, that's usually a sign of striving as well. Make sure it's nicely balanced. I also like just being aware of the muscles in the front of the face. If they are tight, it's usually an emotional baggage that I'm carrying. Fear, anxiety, doubt. 
You can read those emotions on a person's face. So I make sure my face is so relaxed and at ease. There is no burden of emotional baggage to carry. And as I mentioned earlier, how to have a gatekeeper. If there's any part of your meditation, any problem which keeps reoccurring, it could be sleepiness, it could be thinking about all the problems in your life. Make a resolution right now. In your own words, as short as possible, be really aware when you're saying it, something like, I will not think of my business. In your own words, this is just what I'm saying. I will not think of my business. I will not think of my business. And when you make it quite clear in your own language, and then after you're finished with it, you don't need to think about it again. That program is embedded into your mind. If you start thinking about that business, the mind will remember and will restrain you. So you can still maintain the peace without the introduction of new thoughts. The instructions have been made. And they, went, they will work when they are needed. As I mentioned in the simile of the uh, thousand petal lotus, in order to open up this body and mind to go inside, so you can experience the breath easily and joyfully. All you need to establish is the awareness and the kindness. So what are you what are you experiencing right now? Don't choose an object of meditation. Don't say to your mind, come on, let's watch the dress. No. Ask yourself, what are you aware of right now in this moment? That becomes the most important, valuable meditation object in the world to you. The one which is happening right now. And what to do? To care for it, be kind. We start off like that. And later on, you find the mind goes into a, a deeper meditation object. Make sure the kindness and the care are strong, because otherwise you lose interest and go to sleep. Whatever you're experiencing right now, really get to know it. You're building up the awareness and the kindness, which will open this out to see what's inside. And you may notice that if you practice this as I instructed, the mind cannot wander off. Wherever it goes, you go with it. Whatever's happening now is your object of meditation. Care for it.
If your body is relaxed, whatever's happening right now, you find you're going into the center of time, into the present moment. Not choosing what you watch in the present moment. As long as it's happening now, that's good enough. If it really is happening now, it shuts off the door to the future, where you want to go, what you want to achieve. Instead, you're just aware of what's happening now. That is the most important. And reassure yourself, as was said many times, this moment is where your future is being made. If you are kind to this moment, you will find kindness will exist in the future for you. You can hear the sound of this aircraft. I'm not trying to get rid of it because it's happening now. It's okay, it's allowed. I'm aware of it, I'm being kind to it. When the mind is more kind and accepting, then the stress of trying to be somewhere where you're not, getting rid of things which you think are not allowed, that stress disappears. I'm at peace in the sound of the aircraft. And in this moment, I'm being kind and aware. And I try and open up that awareness as much as possible to listen to all the sounds of the rain on the glass windows, of the car, or just the hum of the stillness in the air. These are beautiful sounds, like music, a symphony of silence. And the more I get into this present moment, the more I see the words cannot capture its beauty. Descriptions are kind of irreverent. I don't need to give anything a name. In medieval philosophy, you give something a name then you have power over it. You don't have a name for it. You cannot control it. You can't control it. You have to let it be. Right now, what's happening in your mind? Are you aware? Are you kind to what you're experiencing? How do you be kind? You say something like, the door of my heart 
go of my mind is open to whatever's happening now. And I value every experience. I will not try to control anything. Just let things be. And see if that awareness and kindness will take you deeper into the present moment and deeper into silence. And actually it takes you deeper into your mind. So you can answer the question for yourself later on what this mind actually is. And kindness is the opposite of controlling. Controlling and thinking in a place you shouldn't be trying to get to another place where you think you should be. That's all control. And that's specifically what the Buddha said is suffering. Being separated from where you are, from where you want to be. Being in a place you don't like being. That's called suffering. In the Dharma class which I gave yesterday, And you're happy to be here, no matter where here is, you're free. You don't have to strive. Be happy to be where you are. Don't imagine being somewhere else. See if you can understand the word peace. Peace combination of silence and stillness where there's nothing disturbing only feeling safe cared for there's nothing to worry about so the mind is more than silence is peaceful. You get to be careful, there's no need to distract yourself by thinking you should get deeper. Stay here and the deeper meditations come in when your mind is peaceful enough for you. Just keep being aware of the slay of the petals and the lotus that is you. And minute by minute, the petals open up. And the deeper you go into that lotus flower, the more fragrant, the more beautiful more incredibly beautiful 
those experiences are. And all your role is be mindful, be kind.
close now the end of this meditation period how are you how deep can mindfulness and kindness open you out how does the mind and the body feel right now. Meditation is not forced. The mind relaxes from kindness. It always tends to feel so much more peaceful, so much more rested, and also alert. Usually at the end of the meditation, one can look back and say, what worked, what didn't work? Were you really being aware? Were you being kind? You get more understanding what those qualities truly are. kindness and the mindfulness. And I will invite you when you feel comfortable to open your eyes. complete this meditation. I thank you for participating. It is time for doing whatever you feel will nourish your mind and body, which may include food, or tea, or walking meditation, rest, etc. So please get plenty of rest, especially in these first couple of days, and then we'll meet again for some guided practice with Ajahn this time at three o'clock. So as usual, if you can come a little bit early, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Please enjoy your time with yourself and be your own good friend. Take care.